Hey, everybody, this is David Paul, the host of the Capital Stack podcast, where we talk to founders, operators, investors, and now authors of all things startups and tech investing. Today, I am with Jimmy Sonny, who is the author of the new um, uh, book that just came out called The Founders, the story of PayPal and the entrepreneurs who shaped Silicon Valley. This is not Jimmy's first book. He's done uh, two others, uh, another one called A Mind at Play, which was how Claude Shannon invented the information age, as well as Rome's Last Citizen, The Life and Legacy of Plato. This is the first time I'm talking to Jimmy. Hopefully I won't offend him too much. Uh, Jimmy, how you doing? I'm great. I'm, I'm glad to be breaking the mold and uh, an author instead of, you know, all these people who do real work. <laughs> Well, like I, I'm just I'm I'm flattered that like I, I'm included on your like pump your book tour. <laughs> like how many how, how many podcasts have you done? A bunch, but you know, it's the book has been out for a while. So this isn't even this is just because we were introduced and you know, um and I so I'm glad to be talking to you because you you're in this world, right? I'm an imposter. You're actually you live it. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit of an imposter, but um, <laughs> at least I, at least that's my my kind of my imposter syndrome. So so tell me, Jimmy, like how did you get into into writing? You know, that's a good question. Um, boy, I'm trying to think back. You know, it's sort of it's been a while. Um, I was always a reader. I mean, that's I think like most writers they write because they read something great and they wanted to basically imitate it. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's people who grow up wanting to be Michael Jordan and then there's people who grow up wanting to be Walter Isaacson. And, and I'm in the latter camp cause I'm five foot seven and wasn't going to be MJ. Um, mm-hmm. but I think that's part of it. I, I grew up really loving books. Uh, and I think there's a, I found that for me, it was like, Oh, this, the act of reading then sort of grew into the act of writing. And then I did a bunch of nerdy stuff like school paper and yearbook and all that stuff. And, you know, one thing led to the other. And I started thinking about doing books and then did a book and had some success and kind of pieced it together from there. There's no grand plan. I mean, writing, you know, like writing can take any number of different forms, but for me, it was starting out with a love of reading when I was a kid. And so how did you, so how did you come upon writing about, um, this particular book, uh, you know, the founders. And then, I mean, was that, did that evolve off uh, a mind at play? And, you know, if you could just give kind of the, the, the journey of like why you decided to focus on um, this particular group of people that are known as the quote unquote PayPal mafia and and how they shaped it and kind of what, what your interest and brought you to them from, it looks like you know, writing more about history kind of in your early days. Yeah, no, no, no. I was, I was almost exclusively writing about dead people. And this is like my first alive people project. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. take us back. My last book about Claude Shannon, uh, when I was researching and writing about him, I wrote, uh, about a, a couple chapters, like it's threaded throughout the book, but a couple chapters specifically on Bell Labs where he worked. And Bell Labs is like, you know, it's like a super startup, uh, in some ways, uh, it's a gigantic company, but it has this, it, it, they, you know, they create touchstone dialing, the transistor, they win multiple Nobel prizes. It's like, it's like the, the dream team of American innovation in the 20th century, arguably. I started to think about what were other teams like that? Like, where else do you find these clusters? You see it at Xerox Park, you see it at Fairchild Semiconductor, and you see it at PayPal. And I just, you know, I kind of, I assumed that somebody had done the book. Like, I mean, this is like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and all these people. But there hadn't been a really an in-depth look at 1998 to 2002, kind of providing a look at like, what was it like to build PayPal? Like, what was that actually like? Everybody had covered the other stuff, right? Rockets and Palantir and, you know, all that. Um, well, but, yeah, yeah. And, and, and as individuals, right? Yep. Like, and if there was like so many great autobiographies about Elon Musk, of, of Jobs, you know, but no one really covered in like, what was the team that and what made them so exceptional? Yeah. And so that was how I found my way into it is I just started asking the question like, wait, hold on, like, I understand all of you are rich and famous, but you know, what, what, what happened at the beginning? Like, take me, take me on like the VH1 behind the music, you know? And I found that you know, maybe by, by, for a number of reasons, but these people were unusually open to talking about that period in their lives. Uh, 20 years had passed since the creation of PayPal, but they had built a template for entrepreneurship that still influences not just their work, 
right? Which is huge, but also the work of so many other startup founders and founding teams. So that's kind of how I found my way into it was just asking questions, not maybe about like what some people would think of as the least interesting thing going on in Elon Musk's life is something that he did 20 years ago and doesn't do today. I found that it was hugely interesting from the perspective of, well, how did these people become who they are? Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so when you were out to like discover this process, like how did you go about, you know, structuring, I, I mean, like a thesis for a book? I wrote a book once. It was absolutely terrible. Um, and I, I scrapped it, but you know, so like for someone who writes a quality book, what does that look like from like discovering, like you really want to dial this in to actually structuring, um, the discovery process? Yeah, it, um, you know, it varies from author to author. Um, and I can tell, and actually it varies from book to book. Like that's, what's even more interesting is that you actually like know two, you know, sort of there's some, some common things, but, um, I was depending on three or four buckets of material. One, bucket one was, you know, it's really, there's a lot that was written about PayPal in the years when it was being created, like 1998 to 2002, 2003. So I had these enormous folders and like kind of like organized documents that were just press releases from the company at that time, articles in magazines, feature profile. Like I'll give you an example. There's a profile of Elon just after his first success at Zip2 that was written in the, the, the University of Pennsylvania alumni magazine, right? So I had this like multi-page mm -hmm. like profile. So I printed out and kind of went through and found all of that material. That's kind of bucket one. Bucket two is I sat with all these people. So I sat with, you know, 200 plus people, Elon, Peter, Reed Hoffman, et cetera, and just would spend time like talking to them, like, okay, tell me what happened. Tell me how you joined the company. Tell me what you're doing in college. Why this and not this? How did you decide to become CEO? All of that. So I had interviews. The third big kind of tranche of material was stuff that was given to me by people who lived the story in the form of emails. So they had a lot of people have kept documents. They had kept, you know, gigabytes worth of old little notes and things and business plans. So I'll give you, you know, another example. I had every business plan that the company used to pitch itself for over a year. So I could see how they changed and iterated over that year. Um, so that's kind of bucket three. And then bucket four was, look, YouTube and all, all of the digital video platforms are basically enormous libraries that if you approach them in the way that I did, which is just like literally make spreadsheets of every time they open their mouths, you can learn a lot about the way they answer questions or about like, oh, they talk about this, but not this. So I spent a lot of time just looking at that existing available material. So it was those four, I mean, it was an enormous amount of time. This is about six years worth of time put into this book. But those are the four big buckets of where I was getting stories, lessons, insights, details. It gave me the ability to fact check. Kind of that was my somewhat insane process. And that's like, that's, that's incredible. So that's, you really have to be a detective. You do. You're part detective, you're part therapist, you know, cause you find that like, if you're there interviewing and you're just listening to somebody, like they'll start to talk about, you know, various things that uh, are beyond the scope of the project. You're also part sleuth. Like you have to find stuff out that other people haven't found out. Um, and so it's, it's a lot, of, you know, it's, it was great fun. I, I it was really intense, uh, but I do miss it now that it's over. Yeah, I mean, and I'm sure it's kind of lonely because you're working alone on a project that only you really know about, right? I, I, I guess there's not, is there like a writing team or no. how does that work? Yeah, this is, it, it is, it's lonely. <laughs> you're the team? No, you're the team. You know, it's not totally lonely in the sense that, um, well, for two reasons. One, you know, I had research assistants and I had an editor at Simon & Schuster that I was working with and I had people around who were doing that. But the other thing is, I was dealing with characters who were alive, right? And so I had the opportunity to get on phone calls and, and listen to them tell them, you know, they were telling me their stories. So meaning it wasn't just sort of like me hacking away by computer. Like I was, I sat in Elon Musk's living room and talked to him about this period in his life. And so you do have that level of interactivity. Um, I think the other thing that people forget is like, this is going to sound a little weird, but these characters, when you're writing a book that takes this long, the character becomes like a roommate in your mind. So you wake up every day and like, they're there. You go to bed and they're there, you know? And so they sort of live in your mind because you're thinking about them so much. And the reason you're thinking about them so much is because 
you want to make it possible for a reader that doesn't know anything about technology or investing or venture capital or startups right. to understand it. But that means you just gotta like think about like what's like how am I gonna make this work? So they end up occupying space in your head. So you're never truly alone. And if by the way, if all of this sounds insane, <laughs> if all this sounds like totally ridiculous, it's because it is, right? Like I should be in an asylum somewhere. Right. Um, but it right. does work from the perspective of like I do, you know, I've got I, I got I'll give you an example. I found one of Elon's old bosses and I interviewed him at length. He, he, I sent him the book and he wrote me a note saying, when people ask me in the future for a good portrait of what Elon, how, how he thinks or what he's like for this period in his life, I'm going to send them to your book because this is the Elon I know from when he was 20 something. Right. And that was a great, that was like the best mm -hmm. note I could get. But to do that, I had to do this sort of obsessive multi-year, like thinking about how to bring this to life. Wow. That, that's super, super interesting. How did you score the interviews? Because I'm sure everybody wants to e interview Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and all these guys. Yeah, it's a it's a totally fair question. And obviously, they, they get hit up all the time, right? David Sachs, hit up all the time. Reid Hoffman, hit up all the time. I mean, this is like Max Levchin, hit up all the time, right? These people run companies today, so and mm -hmm. they invest in things today. Um, two, two or three things helped. One is I wasn't there for the usual kind of project, right? So I'm not there like writing about something that's going on in their lives today. I'm writing about something that's going on, went on in their lives 20 years ago. So I have a little bit of a different mission. Things are settled, right? Like, like if I were to ask you about college, right? Or if I were to ask you about something that happened mm -hmm. 10 years ago, mm -hmm. it's different than if I'm like, hey, let me write a profile yeah. about your podcast, you know? That's one thing. The second is, I, yeah, and it, and it's and it's it's less gotcha, right? Like yeah. they like they don't think that they're on that they're going to say something wrong about like you know pumping Dogecoin or yeah. you know they're not going to catch them up. It's already been it's already been done. And and I I don't like the gotcha the game anyway. Like it, I I told them pretty explicitly from the start. I said, listen, like part of my understanding here is I want to know why PayPal succeeded where others failed. Um, so I want to understand like decisions about product design and buttons and. Uh, attrition and customer acquisition cost and how you built not just a viral product, but a successful business. I, my approach was not, was probably more like, like stuff they want to talk about anyway. Right. The second thing is, you know, mm -hmm. in, in some cases I did cold outreach, but in many cases I obviously was trying to like, I'd have one person interview, introduce me to someone else. Right. Uh, and so I always tried to be respectful of like not making too many asks, but you know, it was easier for me if somebody pave the road for some of these people. And a few of the people who I interviewed early were willing to make introductions. And in some cases, and I'll be honest, part of what they did was they just didn't say no when I reached out to somebody and then they double checked, you know? Uh, so I had some benefits there, but I, it, part of it was just shoe leather. I was just a lot of cold, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cold emails. Good for you, man. What a, what a great, what a great story. And then, you know, so you're, you're collecting all of these data points from all over the end. There's, there's endless amount of data and you're crafting a story in your head. How did you think about structuring an outline with a book like this, where there's just so many personalities? I mean, there were mergers in that story, um, you know, like oustings, firings, like there's just so many like areas of, in complexity to that story. How did you think about making something digestible enough? um for a layman yeah you know you're you're sort of describing like the great challenge i lived with every day for this whole time um there were a couple things that i i always kept in my head one is i had a timeline right like this company had a beginning a middle and an end so i'm not making stuff up it's not fiction i actually think fiction is super hard i don't know how people do fiction right but i had like <laughs> there i had like 1998 1999 2000 2001 2002 like i had a sequence mm -hmm. So I had a pretty rigorous sense of like, the story has to go from point A to point Z. Like it's gotta, I've gotta get, I know where I'm headed, right? It's not, it's not like at the end, like, you know, the Death Star suddenly gonna appear, it's not random, you know? It's, it, there's like a real, there's a, there's a reality to this. The, se the second thing is um, I tried to listen to what people were telling me was important. So I'll give you an example. One of the episodes in the book is the company's response to the 9-11 attacks. The 9-11 attacks, you know, everybody can remember of a certain age, can remember where they were when they learned about 9-11 and the experiences that they had on that day. 
for 200 plus people, I asked them what the experience of 9-11 was like. And I asked people who worked at the company briefly and I asked Peter Thiel. And so I had this, I knew that like, you can't not include 9-11, right? So if something came up enough, it was one of those things that like, I can't not include this. Like it would be the kind of thing where like, you couldn't tell the story of PayPal without telling the story of its IPO. And so I would make it a point to just listen to what people would tell me about the IPO. So I used data points that emerged over and over again as a good signal for what to include. And then I would say the last category of the last sort of thing I was thinking about is I'd always ask myself, like, how can I entertain readers? How can I make them laugh? Like, what's a story nobody's ever heard? Or what's a story that people have heard, but they don't know the details of? So a good example is there's a car crash involving Elon and Peter. Is, is the car crash, like, totally relevant to the PayPal story? One could argue about that. But is it super interesting and kind of like an amazing scene and literally like helps pull readers in? Yes, it does. So some of them are just editorial choices. Got it. Got it. And so when I think about, you know, you going through the six year journey of interviewing and pulling all this data together, I think about just how much of a, of a great listener you must be uh, and like how important of a skill set that is. Did you ever find it difficult to like have that endurance, that listening endurance to try to find the right story versus trying to like, you know, like force something that is kind of a, a model in your head. I've got a really hard time with listening versus waiting for my turn to speak. Right. So, I mean, like from your perspective, is that a gift you've always had or is that something that you have to work on constantly? I mean, it's definitely the latter. It's something I have to work on all the time. Um, it's a really, you know, it's a really, really perceptive question. And I have coded two thoughts that jumped to mind for me. The, the challenge wasn't listening. The challenge was actually managing my anxiety when I was sitting in front of some very, very, very smart and very successful people and trying to not feel like an imposter while I was sitting with them. So you can imagine, like, I'm not, hmm. I'm not a daily journal. I don't write for TechCrunch, right? Like I had to like Google what an IPO, you know, it's like, I, I mean, I know things, but I had to look things up that were pretty basic. And you don't want to sound like an idiot in front of Elon Musk or David Sachs, right? Or Max Levchin. These people have like many IQ points higher or many IQ points higher than me. So I had to know enough. And, but, but the tough thing was actually like managing my anxiety to get too enthusiastic or like kind of dial it back a bit because the instinct was, you know, I'm sure you can appreciate this. The instinct was always like, what the hell am I doing in this room? <laughs> there, was, there was a little bit of just like, what am I doing right. here? That was one piece. But the second thing I would say is, you know, over the course of the interviews, one of the things I learned is that we, we don't, like these people aren't listened to. Like nobody actually takes the time to just sit and listen to them and to, to really hear them. And, and I found that at the end, like it's part of what happened is that I was some, sometimes the only person that didn't have an agenda in their day. I wasn't there asking for money. I wasn't there asking for a job. I was just asking them, about some experiences from their early life. And I was really listening, like really trying to figure out what was going on. And I, you know, it turned my hour long interviews into two and three hour long interviews. But I think that is because there's not a lot of that kind of listening going on. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Like, and nor do they have to like think about a decision that they proactively have to make. They're really just kind of reminiscing on something that they've already done, which could be nostalgic and cathartic for them at the same time. And that that's a lot of, um, a lot so, of this was like that. A so, lot of the interviews were, were a walk down memory lane is the way I would describe them. Yeah, which is non-threatening and probably something they enjoy doing. So tell me, tell me like, you know, for the, for the listeners, I mean, I think everyone in in this in this world in my listenership know about the importance of of you know who Elon Musk is. Um, they might be less familiar with the other names, but to tell I'd love for you to just kind of tell the audience without giving away without giving away too much of your book. Um, what what was what was the thing that made PayPal so special uh, with that team? at that time and and what made them like really 
propel and break off and and do you know uh, break off and to start these incredible companies like LinkedIn, uh, you know obviously Tesla, SpaceX, um, Yammer, all these great companies and um, and and what what made it just so special? Yeah, it, you know it's sort of the the question that in some ways I'm still struggling with. Like I you know I'll probably be thinking about this for the rest of my life. Um, there's a few things that made that experience of building PayPal unique. One was enormous pressure. Uh, and the pressure came in the form of the dot-com bubble bursting in the year 2000. So the company starts like in you know late 98, early 99, and the bubble bursts in early 2000. And so you actually have this situation where they just close a big round, but they don't have a ton of runway. And they've got to figure out like how to make this money losing enterprise into not a money losing enterprise, right? And that pressure really is generative. Like it, 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 it's like being in like a gym for a company. You know, they have to really, they have to like figure it out or, or they're going to die. Um, that's one thing. The second is somewhat self-evident, but important to emphasize, which is the talent pool at this company was insanely high. There are the people we know about, the people whose names are in the newspapers and, and on TV. There's also a whole roster of people that I interviewed that you've never heard of who are just like ridiculously intelligent, right? And this wasn't my assessment. This was their colleagues would say, oh my God, so-and-so is a genius. you know. And I heard that over and over again. The third thing I would say, and this is going to sound a little odd, but it's kind of one of the things that emerged from my interviews. They had really good opponents or like enemies. So they had to fight eBay. They had to fight the government at different points. They had to fight Visa, MasterCard. They had to fight other startups. But that pressure, that sort of uh, th th having a foe is actually part of the, the secret sauce because they had someone that like dissolved other issues, meaning the focus was like, how do we not get beaten by eBay? And I had this person, Sky Lee, who I interviewed, who said, nothing brings a company together like having a mortal enemy. Uh, and it's one of my like favorite lines in the book is nothing brings a company together like having a mortal enemy. And they had really good enemies. That's that's um, that's super interesting. And so when when you when you were crafting the story and 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 coming up and coming to kind of these conclusions, um, like do you like I I often feel this is kind of just making me think a little bit more about you know just kind of the ebbs and flows of markets and you know I know we're not, in, I'm not in Silicon Valley. I kind of vacillate between Phoenix and Southern California, but you know, generally we see like cohorts of, of greatness. Right. And it's just kind of like this tide that ebbs and flows of like, you know, really great founders and really great companies. And then it just kind of like peters off and then it comes back and then it kind of peters off. Do you, do you see that as this being kind of the same, the same kind of scenario or like, it's just kind of a timing market cycle thing or, do you think that um, you know it, it was just kind of coincidental that all this stuff just kind of launched at the same time? So, and I'm talking about the the after effects, like all yeah. of them like stepping off and like building other big companies, and like where that was timed with like the rest of the market within the dot you know the dot com the internet right? Was the PayPal that IPO'd right after the dot com bubble, if I remember correctly? It, right? Yeah, it was February fourteenth, two thousand two, was when it IPO'd. Um, so. Here's, here's a useful way to think about it that was, that was for, from my observations and conversations with the team. You know, you have essentially two years where the markets implode and, and all the dot coms that are high flying, that are buying a lot of Super Bowl ad time are suddenly like non-existent, right? Pets.com is like the canonical example, but they all go under, right? And you have a whole group of people that in many cases, like investors and operators who lose faith in the web, right? Like this is like sort of the internet is a fad like era where like the dot-com bubble burst. And I was like, oh, the internet, that was a fad, right? Out of that, coming out of the wreckage of that, you have a group of people who have done well, have not done like, you know, insane, put your name on the side of buildings well, but have done well. And they have faith that you can take uh, a service like payment, uh, peer to peer payments and bring it to scale and then build a business around it. So they've seen the consumer internet do what everyone said the consumer internet was going to do. So they didn't have the pets.com experience, right? They had this other experience. So now they have a little bit of capital and they have confidence 
So when Jeremy Stoffelman and Russell Simmons say, hey, we have this idea for this thing called Yelp and Yelp is going to like change how people like interact with their local environment to be able to leave reviews and find businesses. You know, Max Levchin, their colleague says, here's, I'm a first investor. Here you go. You'll build it. YouTube, Yammer, Palantir, right? SpaceX, Tesla, they have confidence that they've seen technology succeed and they've seen digital technologies like take the promise of the web and make it a reality, but also make it financially viable. So you have those two things. You have a little bit of capital. You have people who are still pretty hungry and pretty young. And you have a successful case study in everything from viral marketing to challenging the financial services infrastructure. So that's the, that's like, and you're, they, they, they finish all this up in 2002 when people are just starting to write the articles of like, maybe the internet wasn't all hype, <laughs> right? So they're, they're emerging into the, like the optimistic <laughs> phase of this little, of this little thing. And so I think, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, I could go for hours just on this topic, but it's that it's a, you, you had a group of alumni who had seen the internet succeed because they built this thing, PayPal that is still around 20 plus years later. Yeah. And, and like everyone went risk off, they figured out how to make money during a dry period. They built it, they sold it. They all had a lot of value and they knew how to build companies. Right. And then when the time when, um, you know, I think mobile was coming out, web two was really starting to emerge and, um, they kind of were able to ride the wave of people going more on risk over the next, you know, 10, 15 years till the, the next recession, which was the more real estate related than, than, uh, than um, technology related. And if you, look at, if you look at the cap tables of a lot of the early social networks and a lot of those 2002 to 2005 ventures, you will find a PayPal alumnus on many of those. So, you know, the most famous example, obviously, is Peter Thiel investing in a young Mark Zuckerberg when he has this idea called thefacebook.com, right? Um, you had mm -hmm. people who believed that this trajectory, like code to product to business to company was possible at a time when many people did not think it was. And, and like they have a little bit of capital to deploy in that effort. So this is really um, relevant, I think. And I don't know if you meant this to be really relevant when you were writing this, but you know, this, when did the book come out? It came out in February. So, and by the way, there was no plan like this. So there's no, there's no way that I planned any of the relevance, if there is some. <laughs> right. So, I mean, the market is, is bottoming out. People are saying this is kind of the next 2001 and, you know, your book comes out, which is, you know, right after it takes place right after the 2001 crash. So like what, what can an operator learn, you know, from this experience about, about, you know, scrappiness and, and entrepreneurship in a, in a, in a risk off financing world. Yeah, I think it, it is really funny. I haven't really thought about it until now, but this is sort of a user's guide to how to survive a tough period where, where funding is not as accessible. Um, you know, there's a bunch of specific lessons, I think around product market fit and around customer acquisition and around how you manage, you know, burn rates. And I suspect that there's some of that in the book, but there's probably better resources like on Twitter for the specific stuff. I think that the thing that people will take away if they're reading the book is how a leadership team can move very, very aggressively and, and, and turn the, the pressure of not being you know, not having us another round of financing into action, right? And so part of what this team did really well is <laughs> problem solve very rapidly in order to figure out, for example, financial fraud when they knew that this could kill them. And, and there was a way in which there's like, that can be soul sucking, right? Like you could, you could see a universe and like, like waking up every day, feeling like you're going to die is not a great way to live. Right. But the PayPal team turned it into uh, energy, kind of the energy to solve problems over and over and over and over again until the team got the right answer. And it wasn't always pretty and it wasn't always pleasant. And, you know, it wasn't always like, like there was a lot of doom and gloom, but I feel like that's the, the managing the psychological piece during a recession is actually in some ways harder 
then and like keeping faith and optimism that is is part of it i would also argue that the other thing is team design so you didn't have people who were like wildly optimistic all the time you didn't have people who were the you know the friendliest people to be around you didn't have people who were like the best engineers you had a mix and you had some people who you know were really pessimistic but in a in a productive way and then you had some people who were just idea machines who just were the generative idea types and i feel like how do you configure a team is actually one of the big lessons from the book um, and how you do it in a resource constrained environment. So how do you recruit somebody when the promise is not, hey, we're going to be, we're sure to be successful. It's actually, hey, we might die, but here are the five reasons you should join this company. Um, those things emerge from the book. And I suspect that for people who are staring down the barrel of, you know, difficult economic times to come, there could be real, call it psychological bucking up that happens from the book. Yeah, I've never been through a, I mean, I've been through a downturn, but I was super young and right. That wasn't, I was, I had a business, but it wasn't, you know, it was in healthcare. So it wasn't super, um, super affected uh, when I was an operator millions of years ago. But, you know, I'm thinking about just kind of the entrepreneurs today. I literally, you know, just passed on a, on a deal that a friend of mine showed to me. And I was like, you know, one of a couple of investors that he showed it to. And the next day he's like, yeah, I don't know if this idea is going to work. And I'm like, because I passed, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I was like, if you're like, I mean, what do you, what the fuck are you talking about, man? Like, right. I mean, just because, you know, I showed you like, you know, that the possibly that this, you know, the numbers don't work today. doesn't mean that like you can't fix it. And I think that people have been playing startup for a little bit and, you know, not understanding that like this, this, this game isn't meant for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't have put it better. Um, I walk away with a real admiration for the risk taking of the people who decide to do these ventures in down markets, um, because it's not easy. You are, you are not playing with like endless amounts of funny money. Right. And particularly in 2000, I mean, I think the NASDAQ at one point lost like 86% of its value you know, people like Amazon was like, I mean, it was not a penny stock, but it was like, you, it was a sea of red ink, right? And you have in that, in that moment, what you have to do if you are, you know, the, the leadership team of PayPal is you have to make this thing work. And to me, that's the remarkable thing about this story is not that PayPal was built in 95 to 98 and went public and everybody was successful and it all worked out and it was all charming, you know, and it was a great fairy tale ending. It was actually like they survived in the middle of the worst calamity to hit their industry until that up, up to that point in time. And so to me, though, that the interesting thing is. I don't think you can have a successful PayPal without the dot com bubble bursting because it provided a pressure mm. that wasn't there before. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, that's sort of mm -hmm. the like way I would think about it. Yeah. Um. And so w when you think about like the PayPal mafia, and I've always had this question, when does the PayPal mafia stop? Like who's actually in that group? Because I know a lot of people that are like employee number like 52 that say that they're in the pay PayPal mafia. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to pin down with like a ton of precision. There's not like a, uh, there's not like an accent. There's not like a, a black card or like a, you know, a secret handshake or anything like that. Um, <laughs> I wish, I wish there was, it would be hilarious if there was, uh, like it turns, it turns out that like nobody told me the secret handshake and there was one, I would find that very funny. Um, generally mm -hmm. it's regarded as pre IPO PayPal employees from, you know, 1999 to 2002, roughly. Um, I, I okay. would, I would, I would say though, that like your, your question is an interesting one. When are they done? And, and, you know, most of the people I interviewed were in their mid forties to mid fifties. And they are, I had multiple people I interviewed who took companies public during the time I was writing the book. So Max Levchin took a firm public, David Gauzebeck took Matterport public. Um, you know, there were multiple public companies born in the time that I was writing this book and they're far from finished. I mean, you, as you and your listeners probably know better than I do, like Keith Raboy, uh, the, you know, the, Ken Howery, the folks who are uh, roll off both as the head of Sequoia Capital, right? So these people are not like they're not in retirement. They are far from it. And they're continuing to shape mm -mm. technology today. 
Who, uh, who's your favorite? <laughs> that's like, that's like asking me to, to pick a, a favorite kid. Um, I've got I, a favorite kid. You know, you do too. <laughs> well, I just have one. So my answer is easy to that one. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I would, I would say that I, I kicked the book off with an unexpected figure. Um, people, I think when I was writing the book, they were like, oh, you're going to, chapter one's going to be Elon or chapter one's going to be Peter. Um, chapter one is Max Levchin. And Max is a well-known figure in Silicon Valley circles, but he's not a household name, you know, in the country. Um, and I think his story is the quintessential entrepreneurial story. And I think he's an engineer's engineer and he is hugely, in, uh, he's hugely quirky and he has done this entrepreneurship thing again and again. And I think he's someone who, for me, the reason I kicked the book off with him is, and I actually end it with him really, is because that he, he is the model for what this looks like, right? Um, he's not trying to be famous. In some ways, I think he was like, not totally thrilled that he was like the centerpiece of the book, but I would, I, he's not my favorite because I think it's hard to pick favorites. I interviewed, I interviewed a lot of great people, but there's a reason that I kicked the book off with him because I think of him as actually in some ways the quintessential example for the kind of engineer that Silicon Valley is made for. Got it. Awesome. So I'd like to shift a little bit off the book. Um, you know, and anybody can buy the book, the founders on Amazon, right? Mm-hmm. It's available, you know, everywhere books are sold. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of just kind of being a creator, being an author, putting out your, your stuff, making yourself vulnerable out there and kind of like, where, where, where's, how important is that today for being like a, a founder, for being uh, an entrepreneur, an investor, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the easy answer is like, it's hugely important. I mean, there's a reason that everyone's doing it, right? Um, but the, the more interesting answer, I think, is we have, it, you know, it used to be that if you wanted to write a book, you had to have a book contract and you had to have a publisher and you had to have an editor and you had to have an agent. If you wanted, David, you could do a book right now in the next two hours and submit it to Kindle Direct Press and get it up tonight, right? Um, we have more mm -hmm. tools at our disposal to be creators. So the excuses are gone, right? If you want to write a blog post, there's no excuse anymore. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to know WordPress. You don't even like you can do, you can do Substack. I get, you know, there's a million tools out there like Substack, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you want to do a podcast, it's not that hard. You know, if you want to do a video, like, there's the tools are ubiquitous. So the excuses are gone and that makes it possible for everyone to do this. What, what I would say is 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 the importance of it um or the thing that i have found most valuable is that two two observations one i sort of figured i would get a big response from american audiences to the book because the people i write about are americans right uh you know the big named americans like are kind of like they're a part of american life like we hear about them they you know they host snl and they they do other things um right yeah I have, I think for every one person from the United States has written to me about the book, two people abroad have written to me. So what is really, really interesting to me is the way in which like, if you're a founder or if you're a creator, I, I think like the, the international audience for me has woken up in a way that it hasn't before. And that might just be because I wrote about tech and like, maybe that's like, maybe that's more relevant, but I think it's something different. I think there's like a kind of audience that we sometimes write off that more of us should be embracing. The second thing I would say is quality matters more in an era where everyone's doing the blogging thing or the this thing or the that thing right um like i'm sure you can appreciate that like you know when one of your podcast episodes is really going to strike sparks and like you keeping your bar for quality high is important right and so i think that there's a way in which we had this like burst of quantity and now we're kind of you know people are finding ways to like inject more quality into the process, whether that is like formatting, if it's a blog post or, you know, creative experiments with video, whether it's TikTok or YouTube, or like, you know, books that take six years. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just riffing, but the idea of a, I'd like to see, like, I, I, I know there are newsletters that are great. I also know there's like, there's newsletters that are 
that I unsubscribe as soon as I get the first newsletter. And I, I think there's going to be more of that pruning that happens because we've got the tools and there's no excuses left. Yeah. Um, mine is definitely a newsletter you'd want to um, unsubscribe to like rapidly. <laughs> 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 like it's such garbage, but, uh, it's opt in. I don't, I don't spam anybody. So, you know, some people like it. I don't know why, but you know, I, I call it ramblings and it literally is maybe two or three paragraphs of just topics that I think about during my insane day within startups, tech, investing, whatever. And, um, people like it. I heard a great quote on LinkedIn today that say 99% of books should be blog posts and 99% of blogs should be tweets. Have you That's heard that funny. one yet? I, ha I have heard that. Um, and you know, maybe there's an argument for that. What I would here, let me offer the, the counterpoint to that. Um, it, it's true for a certain kind of book, right? Uh, like we both know it's true. Like it's, it's definitely true for a certain kind of book. The reason I could not do mm -hmm. what I did in a blog post is because it would take more than a blog post to publish Elon's resignation letter from the company and Peter's note to the company after September 11th and the bullets from the slide where they name PayPal and why that name was chosen or message board observations from eBay users. Could I do that in like a 4,000 word post? Sure. But the things I just listed are, are a total of that, right? Roughly 4,000 words. And you'd get none of the mm -hmm. structure or story. And that's stuff. a different, yeah. And it's a different experience, right? Yeah. I mean, my yeah. stuff, I think all of my stuff should probably be more of a tweet. <laughs> I think it's so, so <laughs> well, intellectually, just it's Twitter so intellectually threads. shallow. You could just do Twitter threads, yeah, right? And then exactly. you get the patina of substance without, you know, like, and you could just do it as multi-part tweet threads. I know, but that even confuses me because then I have to like number them and like that just kind of like throws me off. Like, why can't they figure out that feature where it numbers it for me? Well, I'm sure he'll maybe, I'm, maybe the I'm, he's the you know, I'm sure he'll make that to put that at the top of the list uh, of the product improvements. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure he listens. So um anyway, uh, a couple canned questions before we end. Uh Jimmy, what is your favorite book? Oh, wow. Um Man, this is like the earlier question. I don't, you know, it's hard for me. There's a book that I, there's one book I come back to a lot. Um, actually, sorry. There's a bunch of books I come back to a lot. Um, but there's a, there's a book that, there's a book called The River of Doubt by Candace Millard. Um, and it's about Teddy Roosevelt and this kind of crazy expedition that he goes on to find this like, Lost River. And Candace Millard is just like, she's a national treasure. I mean, her stuff's amazing and it reads like an adventure story and every book of hers I have, and I've read it multiple times. But the reason I admire this one in particular is like Teddy Roosevelt's like one of the most written about presidents ever. Like, I mean, there are just shelves and shelves and shelves of stuff about Teddy Roosevelt. And Candace Millard in our era still found a story that nobody had like really gone in on and made it brought it to life. And so I would say like, it, that's one of my favorite recent reads is that book. Cause I got a ton of favorite books, but that's my favorite, one of my favorite recent reads. Awesome. And then, uh, who's like somebody you really like to follow, you know, on social that kind of gives you inspiration, um, to do what you do. Yeah, I, this one's, this one's a much easier thing for me. Um, I'm a huge fan and admirer of Tyler Cowen, the economist. Um, who runs the blog Marginal Revolution and who blogs about everything. And the reason that I love like just like following his mind wherever it goes is because he's interested in everything. He, lo he loves food and he loves basketball and he loves books and he loves economics and technology and startups and healthcare. And like, I just don't know how he consumes everything he consumes, but it's really cool because in some ways I feel like because of Twitter and his blog and his newsletter, I just get to like borrow his brain and like his brain is filtering all the things that I might find vaguely interesting. And so like in one newsletter, he'll link to like some econometric analysis, something about the Golden State Warriors, like a random YouTube video. It's a conversation between two interesting people. And he's just somebody who like he consumes so much, but the stuff he spits back into the world is such high value. So he's somebody that I'm a big admirer of and that who, whose work I really look up to. 
Yeah, because that's what kind of like that's the that's the the holy grail, right? Is when people follow you, not so much the content, right? And they use you as a filter for content curation. I mean, I basically do this pod to try to get smarter for myself, and if mm. people like it, they follow it, right? And you know, and I think that people just think I'm, you know, funny, just funny enough, and get interesting enough people to to drone out the 45 minutes they take to get to work. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think it's a win win for everybody. I yeah, I think it's a situation if you're if you're reducing boredom in the world, I actually think you're adding you're doing more valuable things than many, many people. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody, thank you for listening to the Capital Stack Podcast, where we listen to founders, operators, investors, and authors about all things startups and tech investing. Um, uh, you can find Jimmy Sony on Twitter. You can find him on Amazon. His book is called The Founders. Uh, if you like this podcast, please share it. Please subscribe. Leave a comment. My goal this year is to get canceled, so so please do your part and try to cancel me and 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 add some <laughs> add something on the on the reviews, and uh, we'll see you next week every Tuesday. Bye bye.